Okay, again, welcome to Heavenly Parents, Holy Community. We believe the essence of God is masculine and femininity. They're really mother and father. That's why your mothers and fathers. <coughs> That's why everybody in the room was born of a mother and father, right? Yes. You had to be, or you couldn't be here. That's the biology of all humanity, because that's the biology of the Creator. Where'd it go, Big John? Big Johnny, Johnny Kenny. There we go. Okay, here we go. And this is me. Substantial, this is a title, February 25th. Substantial love saves the whole world. That's what we talk about when we talk about divine principles. Substantial love, real love on the earth. Because doesn't everybody sing about that when you hear rock and roll? They say, is it real love? Is it not real love? <coughs> Are you going to be here forever? <coughs> Pardon me. And there's my grandchildren. This is my wife. These are some of our grandchildren who we love. There's Walter Lucas and Walter the Fourth and his wife Anna. And here's uh, Pastor Frank with his baby boy, Walter the Fourth. Amazing, huh? Three other grandkids. So that's my gratitude to God and true parents. Because how could that have happened? How could that blessing happen? How could that love happen without God and true parents? Okay, this is the second title. I was trying to think of what's the best title. The Inestimable Value of Substantial Love. Is there something more valuable in our lives than substantial, real, and eternal love? Is there? We always would give that example. If you're very wealthy and very rich, but no one loves you, then you're still miserable. Just ask Hollywood movie stars. And since we're, this begins with Christianity, this is Lent, which I read already. We're in the middle of Lent. And I believe as we're Christians, we should understand Lent, and we should understand these uh, sacrifices uh, from divine principle perspective. In 2024, Easter falls on Sunday, March 31st, and it always changes based on the lunar calendar. You know why? Because they do it in relationship to uh, uh, Jewish calendar. So uh, Easter, of course, represents new life to us. Jesus resurrects, overcomes death, and brings true love to his apostles, and his apostles bring true love to Jesus Christ and God. Isn't that amazing? As Jesus resurrected as a perfected Adam, overcoming all the mistakes of Adam and Eve. Because we say, what happened to human beings? There was a fall of man, people left God, and, then, and, and the fall of man is not one act in the Garden of Eden. The fall of man is in the Garden of Eden, begins there, but then Cain kills Abel. Cain's children have relationships with Seth's children. And then things like if you actually study real history, study the first civilization, are Egyptians, Babylonians, and what's the first thing they do? Kill each other. They go to war. But if they create uh, copper tools. Brought, what do they do? Create bows and arrows and kill each other. And they invent slavery. The first civilizations on earth, from the very beginning of the first civilization, invent slavery. And enslaves uh, all kinds of people from all over the world. And they enslave, enslave everybody. It's unbelievably horrible, the history of human beings. So we say that's the external, outer history of the world. But we say there is an internal history of the world where God is trying to save all human beings from suffering. There's a central history that begins with Abraham and, and continues on, and Jesus Christ is, a, is a, one of the crowning figures of that, right? Jesus becomes, we say, the last, or another translation would be the ultimate Adam, that is eternal father, <coughs> as in Isaiah 9, 6, a life-giving spirit. Do you agree with that one? Yeah. Actually, my life has changed completely because the living spirit of Jesus Christ. And not only that, but he's not only the last Adam, but he's the first of many fruits. There'll be many Adams after him. <coughs> and because of that, because he's a true Adam, he adopts human beings back into the lineage of God. That's who we are. Our whole life, our whole life should be becoming back into the lineage of God, becoming God's true children who God loves and God never loses. Does that make sense? 
I didn't know if I'd tell the story, but I think I will. I don't care what time it is. I had a really good experience with my granddaughter, Ava. My grand, she, she comes to church here sometimes. They're all sick today, have fevers and whatnot. But I came home at 7 o'clock. You know, I do all the church leader meetings, blah, blah, blah. So I love them, but anyway, no, I don't. So anyway, I came late, and it was dinner time, and it was almost bedtime for the kids. And Ava still didn't finish eating her dinner. <coughs> she likes it. She's four years old, so she likes it if I sit down and I feed her dinner like that, which I enjoy doing, believe me. I feed her and then she eats. But about 15 minutes till 7 o'clock, which is bedtime, she was still at the table, all the other, everybody finished dinner, and I walked in and she asked Mom, can I, can I have my cupcake dessert? And Mom said, not till you finish your dinner, and it's getting late, it's 15 minutes till bedtime so I knew she would cry if she didn't finish her dinner and she didn't get a cupcake I knew she would cry and that made me cry Does that make sense anybody else grandparents you cry if your grandchildren cry so my first thing I did is I thought I'll sit down and I'll I'll feed her her dinner quickly so she can have her cupcake which I did David and Anna are not here so I can admit that some of her dinner escaped to, uh, <laughs> escaped to our doggies around the table. Nevertheless, she finished and she had had her cupcake. So I got her cupcake, put her in a bowl, and we went to sit on the couch, and she was so happy. And I felt how happy I feel that she's not crying and that she could have her cupcake. See, that's God. That's what we think God is to you. When you're suffering and you're miserable, God feels, I want to save you, but there are rules and laws and orders of heaven that I have to obey. And if we do not express faith, if we do not express faith, love, loyalty, and substantial love to God, <coughs> pardon me, God can't always save us. Right? So my relationship with Ava is like oneness. I didn't get any cupcake. But I absolutely felt overjoyed that she got her cupcake. Isn't that interesting? I think that's how God feels. Even if God, God didn't make the sun because God needed a light. God made the sun because you need a light. God didn't make the earth because he needed a place, a big round ball that, with water on it. He didn't need that. You need that. And so I think that's how God feels. So, what we're doing is being adopted back into the lineage of God is coming back into that relationship that is so close and so warm that we literally become one flesh with God. And when we're happy, God's happy. <clears throat> we also think because it's Easter, this is the time, 2024 Easter falls on Sunday, March 21st, this is the time that Jesus is the life-giving spirit and tree of life who called Reverend Moon to the mission of teaching us divine principle, the real heart of God. When we talk about the parental nature of God, where do we, where, Jesus began that, but because he was killed, he couldn't give us the complete mission. Reverend Moon came and told us about the real heart of God. Like I was explaining, God's heart is your father and your mother, your grandma and grandpa who loves you more than they love their own life. Isn't that interesting? I don't need to a cupcake to feel happy, but if my granddaughter has a cupcake, then I feel happy, overjoyed. It's how God is, okay? So all this time, I believe Jesus has been guiding true parents, blessing marriages, and the original pattern of God's children, and that's what we're talking about today. This is Divine Principle Books, the 73 edition, brown paperback, page 225, says this. To restore the original status, and that's what we're trying to restore. The original status of your a child of God, where you know God just like you know your mother and father. In fact, better than you know your mother and father, right? To restore the original status by setting the condition at a value less than what was originally lost. For example, we may give the case of liquidating the entire amount of debt through a creditor's grace to the debtor of a heavy debt. Right? Thousands of years of fallen nature. Your ancestors may have been murderers, may have been adulterers, may have done this or that. Nevertheless, you can be forgiven. You may have sinned in your own life. 
Nevertheless, you can be forgiven and adopted back as a pure child of God without blemish. But how? According to this principle, we receive the great benefit of salvation, that is resurrection after spiritual death, identical with that of Jesus Christ himself by setting up the condition of indemnity that we believe in the redemption through the cross. Is that amazing? By simply believing, you become in one heart with God. It's sort of like me and my granddaughter, right? If we become one heart, if she has her cupcake and she knows Abuela did that, we become one heart, one flesh. So even God, <coughs> pardon me, cannot restore man to the side of heaven unconditionally. It's what people don't understand. Why doesn't God just make magic and give me everything I want to solve all the suffering? It can't be. He can't do it unconditionally. Unless man himself establishes the conditions which enable God to claim him back. That's what Reverend Moon has been trying to teach us all these years. To do the conditions that allow God to claim us back. To create substantial love between God and us. <coughs> Likewise, Satan cannot take man to hell unconditionally unless there is some condition in the man himself. So you, God can't, Satan can't take you to hell, but God can't take you to heaven either. There's a midway position when you die. And it's not heaven, it's not hell, but you might as well think it's hell because you're not with your true parent or true love. <clears throat> For example, murder, if you murder, if you ha are hating, lust, adultery, fornication, theft by degree. So we can restore the position of having been born anew through Jesus and the Holy Spirit by setting up the condition of indemnity through baptism, merely by the sprinkling of a few drops of water on our heads. <coughs> Furthermore, we may receive the valuable benefit of eating Jesus' body and drinking his blood merely by taking a piece of bread and a cup of wine at the sacrament of Holy Communion. These are examples of lesser endemic. So this is the Divine Principle book, by the way. Unabridged, clearly exactly what it means. Why do we eat Jesus' body and drink his blood? you have any idea? Because when you're a baby in your mother's womb, you're drinking her blood and eating her body and all the nutrients she receives or you see from your mother's body. So that's a sort of very similar relationship. Okay, we say God is good based upon the foundation of substantial love between Jesus and his apostles. God, become, God sends people, Christians, to produce enough food for people to eat is the restoration of the external world. And I'm going to explain some of this to you. <coughs> John Kenny's song said, we should shout it out to the whole world. Jesus Christ, the love of God, all the good things that God does for us. Based on the foundation of Christianity on earth, the whole world is blessed through Judeo-Christianity, the body of Christ discovering the laws of God. For example, people or atheists always ask, why doesn't God save anybody? Because we have to make conditions for God to claim us back as his own. <clears throat> However, Jesus and God inspired Louis Pasteur, who laid the foundation of world health. Are you saved because a Catholic uh, uh, biochemist discovered uh, pasteurization? Do you think you guys are saved? It's okay to say yes or no. Yes. Yeah, of course you are. You're saved from every waterborne disease. You're saved from rabies. Uh, all kinds of things, right? Louis Pasteur performed pioneering research in stereochemistry. He also invented pasteurization and the vaccines against anthrax, cholera, waterborne diseases, and rabies. You're saved because a Christian thought, ah, oh, I want to give this to the whole world. Everyone should know and understand germ theory, right? And he did. So you're saved by Jesus' Christianity. We should shout it out. He's saved billions of lives all over the world from for, for the last 150 years billions of lives not millions billions of lives have been saved by louis pasteur through christianity that's how god saves people he made a condition to study on how to save human life and that's the result people all atheists always ask why doesn't god save him well god does save people william wilberforce ended slavery in the british empire christian brother based on Christianity, ended slavery in Parliament. Harriet Tubman, Abraham Lincoln, Quakers, Methodists, 
California and democracy ended slavery in the United States. Isn't that amazing? You know why? One of the reasons why there was a civil war? Because California entered the Union as a non-slave state. And because California, Washington, uh, what's the other, Oregon, entered as a non-slave state, there would be more representatives who could now vote slavery out. The South decided to secede from the Union. And I love Harriet Tubman, Christian. These Christians saved millions of people from slavery. Isn't that true? They saved millions of people from slavery. God bless them. And we should shout that out. Christianity, Jesus Christ, is responsible for ending slavery in the United States and the Western Hemisphere. How about this? In the late 1960s, most experts said that the global famines in which billions would die would soon occur. Biologist Paul R. Ehrlich wrote in his 1968 bestseller, The Population Bomb, the battle to feed all of humanity is over. In the 1970s and 80s, <coughs> he's predicted hundreds of millions of people will starve to death in spite of any crash programs embarked upon now. Ehrlich also said, I have yet to meet anyone familiar with the situation who thinks India will be self-sufficient in food by 1971, and India couldn't possibly feed 200 million people by 1980. How many people are now eating in India? Over a billion. Do you know why? I'm going to give you three names that you can understand and you should shout from the mountaintops these three people. Anybody ever hear of uh, Fritz Haber? One of my favorite scientists. He's a Christian Jew. He's Jewish and Christian. And 1933 he thought, he was German, 1933, he thought people are going to starve to death because we, the population is growing, just like Ehrlich said, but we don't have enough fertilizer. In those days, fertilizer had to be cow dung, human manure. That's what fertilizer was, right? But there's not enough of it. That's crazy enough. Anyhow, so, uh, so listen to this. <coughs> Pardon me. The power of belief in Jesus. Nobel Prize winner Fritz Haber. How many people has Fritz Haber saved? This is a, from a Wikipedia article. Fritz Haber, 1968 to 1935, Jewish convert to Christianity who developed a synthetic fertilizer that saved some 2.7 billion lives. Two point, do you see the number? 2.7 billion human beings are eating because Fritz Haber invented an artificial means of creating fertilizer for people, right? Helping the world grow nutritious food. Without his discovery, the expansion of the world's population from 1.6 billion in 1900 to over 7 billion today would, would not have been possible. This is from a Wikipedia article that was a couple years ago. It is estimated that one-third of annual global food production uses ammonia from the Haber-Bosch process, and this supports nearly half of the world's population. Isn't that amazing? Shouldn't we shout this from the mountaintops? But nobody ever heard of Fritz Haber. You know what? He was a, he was a professor, head of chemistry, one of the big German, but he's Jewish. So the Nazis in the 30s persecuted him, and he died uh, in 1935 of a heart attack. How about this guy? Of all the inventions during the first half of the 19th century which revolutionized agriculture, the reaper was probably the most important, wrote University of Chicago historian William Hutchinson in his two-volume biography of uh, McCormick, Cyrus McCormick, in the 1930s. Great invention, right? That we never talk about or never hear about. <clears throat> The reaper broke the harvest labor bottleneck by allowing the farmer to reap as much as he could sow. The big step toward automation allowed farms to become larger and more productive. In turn, the mechanization of agriculture accelerated industrialization and urbanization as displaced workers migrated more rapidly from farms to factories. If you read his biography, one of the reasons the Industrial Revolution occurred is because of Simon McCormick. He invented all these machines for harvesting uh, food and farmers bought them. That means somebody had to make them. And uh, anyway, it's a great story if you ever want to read something. 1831, Cyrus demonstrated his reaper. It was noisy and awkward. It rattled and frightened the horses. Still, it cut the grain. It was revolutionary. For in a few hours, the reaper harvested as much grain as two or three men could cut in a whole day. See what happened? Cyrus McCormick invented the mechanical reaper. McCormick's invention would make him prosperous and famous, but he was a religious young man who believed his mission was to help and feed the world. Where did he get that mission? Matthew 25, right? Feed the poor, help the hungry, take care of your neighbor. 
McCormick saw his work as a holy calling, inseparable from his walk with God. Cyrus's sp spiritual life changed when he was 25. He attended a series of church services one week with his parents and siblings. The following Sunday, Cyrus made a public confession, confession of his faith. He became strongly Christian. This is how they did it when, Cy when, he, was, uh, when he was alive, right? Just one guy, Scythe. You can collect enough wheat then. And now we do these kinds of things, right? How about this one? Okay. This is, the, this is the third character I'm going to reach you. Another strong Christian who decided his job on earth was to feed the poor. His name is Norman Borlaug in the end of famine in the end, at the end of the 20th century. End of famine. Didn't people pray for the end of famines? Didn't people pray to God, please send us rain, plant us food? And what happened? God sent Norman Borlaug and Cyrus McCormick and Fritz Harbour. The Green Revolution usually refers to the transformation of agriculture that began in 1945. One significant factor in this revolution was the Mexican government's request to America to establish an agriculture research station to develop more varieties of wheat that could be used to feed the rapidly growing population of Mexico. They already had poor people who were starving in Mexico, right? With the experience of agricultural development begun in Mexico by Norman Borlaug in 1943, Judge his success. So he helped Mexicans not only make enough food for their people, but to export food as well. Right? So there's no famine in Mexico. There's poor people in Mexico. Now they live in New York City, but, but he made a big giant difference. The Rockefeller Foundation sought to spread the green revolution to other nations. The way of our Christian cultural fear is sharing and cooperating to lift out people out of poverty. This is what happened. Listen to this next one. In 1961, India was on the brink of mass famine, just as Ehrlich predicted. Borlaug was invited to India by the advisor to the Indian Minister of Agriculture, M.S. Swaminathan. India began its own Green Revolution program of plant breeding, irrigation development, and financing of fertilizer. By who? By Fritz Haber. Due to Norman Borlaug's science in 1968, Indian agronomist S.K. De Data publishes findings that IR8 rice yield up to 5 tons per hectare with no fertilizer and almost 10 tons per hectare under optimal conditions. This was 10 times the yield of traditional Indian rice. 10 times. Now it's 100 times, by the way. Famine in India, once accepted as inevitable, has not returned since the introduction of American-led green revolution in agriculture. This is what Christianity has done for the world. This comes from Jesus' simple message of Matthew 25, feed the world, help the world, <coughs> and the creation of modern science by Christians. <coughs> Between 1965 and 1970, wheat yields nearly doubled in Pakistan and India, greatly improving the food security in these nations. These collective increases in yield have been labeled the Green Revolution, and Borlaug is often credited with saving over a billion people from starvation. Isn't that amazing? Isn't this something we should shout from the mountaintops, shout from the rooftops? He was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1970 in recognition of his contributions to world peace through increasing food supply. Ehrlich's predictions failed predictions fail to materialize when India became a self-sustaining in cereal production in 1974. Only six years from Borlaug's coming there. As a result of the introduction of Norman Borlaug's dwarf wheat varieties, what America, through Dr. Borlaug, did was to create what has been labeled the Green Revolution. They say America, right? America is great because America is a Christian nation. It's Christianity that did this. And I'll show you why. Listen. People, atheists, say, I always ask, why doesn't God save someone? Between 19 and 1984, as the Green Revolution transformed agriculture around the globe, world grain production increased by 250% allowing billions of more people, all the Chinese are now eating, all the Japanese are now eating, all, all the Mexicans are eating, everybody's eating all over the world, right? Remember when I was a kid in the 1960s, you always get a report, people are starving over here, people are starving over there, please send money. Now you don't get those ads anymore, right? A yeah, a little bit, but mostly that's due to uh, Marxism and uh, communist socialism. The production increases fostered by the Green Revolution are widely credited with, ha to, with having helped to avoid widespread famine and feeding billions of people. Billions. 
Borlaug was one of the early trustees of Bread for World, serving from 1975 to 1980. Bread for the World is a Christian organization dedicated to feeding the hungry. It's a Christian organization dedicated to feeding the hungry. And have they succeeded? Beyond anybody's imagination. In the article about his, about his funeral, he was described as a devout Lutheran whose faith was the motivation for his mission to use science to feed people. Isn't that amazing? This, according to his daughter, who is quoted in the article, it also explains that he regularly attended church when he was not working on his, out in his mission field, feeding the hungry. Unbelievable. This is, Jesus, this is a work of Jesus Christ. This is what we call the foundation, Jesus' foundation on earth, of substantial love, substantially saving billions of human beings. Now there's 8 billion humans, and we're all still eating, right? Don't you guys have more food than you could possibly eat? Yeah. Yeah, exactly right in some cases. This is Norman Borlaug says, Food is the moral right of all who are born into this world. Almost certainly, however, the first essential component of social justice is adequate food for all mankind. Then by developing and applying the scientific and technological skills of the 20th century for the well-being of mankind throughout the world, we may still see Isaiah's prophecies come true. And the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose, and the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water. And may these words come true by Norman Borlaug. Amazing. What a, hu what a human being. But nobody knows about him, right? Nobody knows about him. Nobody knows Fritz Haber. Nobody really understands Cyrus McCormick. And nobody really understands uh, Norman Borlaug, which we should somehow, I struggle because people don't know. We say God is good. And even though people receive all these benefits of magnificent food production, people don't say, thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Western science. Thank you, America. Thank you. They don't say thank you, do they? They don't recognize the origin of their blessing. And that's like the, one of the biggest problems for human beings. We don't recognize or understand it's God who puts food on your table. It's God's theories, God's ideas, Jesus' message that puts food on your table. But we fail to thank God. We just think, uh, you know, animals did it or farmers did it or whatever in the world we think. Based upon the foundation of substantial love between Jesus and his apostles. Because without Peter, James, and John, without the apostles, where does Jesus' message go? We could say, well, there might have been somebody else. But because the apostles were willing to give their life for Jesus Christ. Isn't that true? God sending people, Christians, to produce enough food for people to eat is a restoration of the external world. <coughs> because the apostles were willing to give their life. They became what we would say one flesh with Jesus Christ, right? If you're willing to give your body for somebody else, your life, that means you're one body with them. And that's the beginning of what Christianity is in the world today. That foundation is a condition, right? God can't work without a condition. That condition of true love is a condition for God to save all mankind and feed all these people. On the other hand, we say that's not enough. We like the external world. We like the food production. Based upon Jesus' appointment of our true parents, true parents brought us the important component of knowledge of God's heart. Most people in the world don't understand God. Even if they believe there's a God, they believe God is some almighty being living on a cloud and doesn't care about human beings or is confused about hurting beings or has this weird mystery about you know, why he doesn't save people. Because people don't understand about the foundation of faith or substance. Reverend Moon taught us God is a parent that longs for the love of his children and longs to bless his children. God wants you to be happy. Just like I want my granddaughter to be happy, God wants you to be happy. He wants all people on earth to be blessed, but to know it's him who gives the blessing. Because that's give and take action. That's what gratitude means. It means you love God. You love God with your whole heart, soul, and mind, with all your strength. Even though Jesus was rejected by his family and nation, and this caused pain in the heart of Jesus and God. And people don't believe that God can have pain. Right? Most Christians, most Jews, most nobody believes God can have pain. They think he's some invulnerable being way out there in space, out of space and doesn't know when you suffer. Doesn't feel when your children suffer doesn't feel when people are murdered or killed or warfare happens under. He doesn't feel. Yes, he does. 
God feels it more than you can feel it. God feels it more than you can understand. Right? And this is important because how can we love God without it? Luke 19.41, as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, Jesus wept over it. Jesus didn't say, well, you knuckleheads are killing me. I hate your guts. I'm sure you're going to hell for sure. He didn't say any of those things. It says he wept. He cried. He cried so much that his apostles wrote it down. It was so significant to his apostles, they had to write it down. Jesus cried for Jerusalem. He cried for the Jewish people. He told the ladies she met on the road, don't cry for me, ladies. Don't cry for me. This is going to be over in a few hours, and I'm going to join my Father in heaven, and I'm going to be all right. But you guys on earth, because I didn't have an opportunity to build the kingdom of heaven, you people on earth are going to suffer for a long time, and that makes me cry. That makes Jesus cry. Luke 42, and, and said to them, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Right? One more. Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Matthew 23. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned those who sent you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks on her wings, but you weren't willing. They weren't able to see or know or understand Jesus. So here's what we believe. If people had believed, if people had believed in Jesus, then it would not have taken 1,900 years to get to universal food production. It would have happened very quickly. If Jesus had lived, taught people, Grew people, the rabbis respected him, loved him, talked to him. Then the whole idea of Western civilization would have happened 1,900 years ago. That's the whole point. But because people didn't understand, they said this is the only way it could have gone. Somehow this is God's mysterious plan. This caused pain in Jesus' heart. He wept, cried, suffered over the rejection of his people, not for himself, but for the lost children of Israel. And for the lost Christians and all the suffering that's going on in the world since that time. On the other hand, however, because the substantial foundation of love between his apostles who were willing to die for Jesus, truth, and early Christians has saved the whole world. Now there's 8 billion people full of food because of these apostles, because Jesus did find faith on earth. Not the whole nation. But because of those apostles, the 72 disciples, 500 others who witnessed his resurrection, then Jesus' message went out and eventually changed the whole world. God sends prophets, leaders who are oft times rejected and suffer at the hands of non-believers. I love and admire Reverend Moon, true father. He was chosen by God to bring the truth of God's heart to us. And unfortunately, he suffered horribly along the way, right? We not, uh, you know, I think I suffered a little bit. Nobody suffered like True Father suffered. Hung on prison. In fact, didn't I write these down? For me, since Jesus, there has been no one greater than True Father in explaining the real heart of God. No, there have been nobody, right? When we heard the divine principle, we were shocked. We were shocked at the simplicity and the depth of the truth that we understood. We had grown up in Christianity and never heard about God's real heart. Never heard about Jesus' real heart. He never heard those things. Right? I cannot think of any saint since Jesus that loved God through the most intense difficulties we could possibly imagine. And we can't imagine them, by the way. <laughs> Unless you've been in Hung Nam for two years and eight months, you cannot imagine the horror of Father's life. Right? I think we should all cry. I think we should all cry that the Korean Christian culture fear that was supposed to receive Reverend Moon and carry him to the USA, carry him to the whole world. There should have been a million Christian Koreans on Father's side to bring the truth to the American people, right? If that was true, then wouldn't we, they all believe? But because, likewise, Father was rejected, and actually, worse than that, right? The tiny, the cultural sphere of the Korean Christian spirit was murdered by Japanese imperialists, and Soviet communists, right? The Soviets came in in 19, end of 1944 to 45, installed, uh, what was his name, Sigmund? Uh, no, not Sigmund, he's a good one. 
Kim Il Sung in charge, and they completely killed, murdered the Christian cultural sphere for the sake of Marxism. And so, remember the last one, how devastating that must have been to True Father, but Hyo Ho Bin rejected his advice and his position, and they were both in prison. Can you imagine that? The last chance, the last person who could believe, the last church, the last group, the last remnant of God's revelation to them that the Messiah would come to Korea in physical form, the last person rejected him. And she was unfortunately killed. Father ended up in Hungnam prison, which we have eyewitness testimony of many people. Wan Pil Kim, who would visit him in prison, of the unbelievable suffering there. But nevertheless, Father prevailed. Family breakdown, his own family broke down, persecution of many nations. And this one was because we were there, right? I was there. The death of Hung Jim. I always think if one of my children died, could I still have faith in God? Right? There, there are certain challenges to your faith, to your life and to your love that will challenge you to keep believing in a benevolent God. Father was uh, working against communism and Hung Jinam passed away. I remember one of the things that made me absolutely believe Reverend Moon loves God more than life itself is instead of crying or cursing God for the death of his child, which any one of us might have done, <coughs> he offered he offered his son to God. He said, God, this is an offering to you. I offer my son, right? It's the same thing Abraham did with Isaac. Same thing Jesus, God did with Jesus Christ. Offered the child. I offer this child. Right? I don't curse you, God, for taking my son away. I love you and I send him into your heavenly arms for your protection. Isn't that amazing? I think it's unbelievably amazing. It's unbelievably amazing to me. So we think Jesus called Reverend Moon, but here's what the Bible says. Luke, Jesus says about calling his prophets and his leaders. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Jesus predicted, maybe no one will believe him. Maybe when I call him and I choose that person, no one will believe him. And he'll just go the way of suffering just like Jesus did, right? My point is... Yes, Jesus found faith. True Father. Yes, true Father and true Mother never gave up and forged out of the world a foundation of substantial love of thousands and millions that will never be forgotten by God. We're celebrating Foundation Day last week. Father said, I've created such a foundation it will never be destroyed. It can't be taken away. Because of what? Not because of buildings or land. Because of you. Because of blessed couples. Because of the 36 blessed couples because of the thousands and millions of blessed couples all over the world. Yes, true parents found faith on earth. Who? You. You blessed couples who were willing to sacrifice everything to support true parents, right? Didn't our families reject us? Didn't the society reject us? Did everybody reject us? But we are still here, right? No matter what. Do you think God can't see that? God sees it better than you see it. God better, knows it better than you know it. In spite of persecution and rejection by our families and society in general, we here remain faithful to our true parents. That's the foundation. Just like Jesus needed Peter, James, and John, Nathaniel, and all the other apostles and disciples, God wanted us. God needed us. God called us, and you remained faithful. Isn't that incredible? And so based on this, then we have Foundation Day. That's what Foundation Day means, right? God will bless you, don't worry, right? That's why we have this celebration of true parents' birth. We have Foundation Day because there was enough faith on earth. Remember I always say, Abraham had to find at least 10. Uh, uh, Elijah had to find 7,000, and so on and so forth. There were 10 bad spies, two good spies. What if there were, what if there were three good spies? Would then the people have been able to go into Israel if there were three good spies? I bet you yes. It's always a number, a matter of numbers. When Jesus found his 12 apostles, when true parents found enough uh, blessed couples, right? He always had, it's got to be 1275 or 10,000, or we got to do 439, we got to do this. And he would find them, then that would be, that's, that's Foundation Day. That's what Foundation Day is, right? This is, this is Foundation Day. <clears throat> so God will bless you. God is timeless. Let me make that clear. God is outside of time and space. God asks us to remember his Sabbath forever, right? This is uh, Exodus. 
Exodus 31, 16. Therefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. These are true Father's words. God invested all of himself into creation. He did not reserve even one ounce of energy. Creation was his total labor, his total effort of giving all of himself. When God put his entire heart and soul into creation as object, he was investing 100% of himself. Only in this way could he, cre could, could he create his second self, the visible God, which is our universe and true children, right? So that's why it's an act of love. Reverend Moon says it's not an act of creation like Henry Ford invented the Model T. It's an act of mother giving birth to her children. And mothers never forget their children, right? They can't ever forget the effort, the crime, the labor, the pain, and then the birth of their children. Mothers can never forget that moment. Right, mothers? Yeah. Same with God. Okay, but here's the point. God says it's forever, doesn't it? It's perpetual, forever. And that's how God feels about you. Likewise, your acts of faith are treasures in heaven that will never be forgotten because that's the nature of God. He's timeless. He remembers your sacrifices and your efforts as if they happen right now, today. He doesn't have a time. He doesn't forget. We will never forget God's Sabbath and God will never forget your sacrifices. God is timeless. Therefore, your sacrifices should never be forgotten. They go into the mix of God's creation of the universe along with God's efforts. We are building the kingdom. We are building the kingdom of heaven on earth. Amen? Amen. 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 Thank you very much. Amen.